Well, good morning. It is good to be back and to be with you all again. Peace of Christ be with you. Do sign in the pew pads and pass them along so we know who all is here with us this day. And again, it helps when you let me know you're on vacation. Otherwise, I'm going to worry about you <laughs> if I don't see you. So, but do, do please sign in to the pew pads. We have uh, two white flowers up here in the bud vases. The first one is in honor of Alfred Wesleski, whose memorial service was yesterday. So our love and prayers are with Bruce and his family. The other one is for Erna Loomis, and her service will be this Saturday. Um, I will meet with Michael. He found out his mother died right before going on the mission trip. So um, he's been in my prayers. They come back tonight, and I hope you will keep him in your prayers too. Uh, the service will be on Saturday. The visitation is at 1 o'clock. The memorial service is at 3 o'clock with a reception to follow. We could probably use some help since it's summertime in bringing some of the salads and the side dishes for the reception. So if you can do that, that would be a big help. Uh, the red rose, though, is the joy that we have that um, El Nathan was born to Chris and Eunice Aquani. He is our financial person, if you have not met him. And we are most excited that he has a baby boy with us now. Uh, today is a special celebration, and Tom, I'm going to ask you to get ready. Phyllis Bush, if you will stand up or raise your hand or whatever you feel, Phyllis. It's her 90th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> All together. All together. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Phyllis. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what a joy. What an absolute joy. Um, again, the mission trip folks will be returning, probably coming in about 10 o'clock tonight, so prayers for their traveling mercies. Uh, peace camp, anyone here to talk about that? That begins this week. We're in our final push uh, for peace camp. And so if you have any children um, ages 8 and up that have not signed up, we are still taking sign up. And uh, the calendar for the activities is out in the narthex uh, so that if you have questions about what the kids are going to be doing, but I think we've got a really great two weeks planned. And next Wednesday night, um, not this coming Wednesday, but on the 26th, we'll end the Peace Camp with a family night uh, with an outdoor uh, barbecue of hot dogs and whatever over the fire, and a v we'll end it with a Vesper uh, service of music and prayers. So right. please come. Everyone is invited for the Wednesday evening um, outdoor uh, service, and so please come and have some uh, food with us and prayer and music. Uh, and enjoy the children and the energy. Yes. So right. if they're going to come to Peace Camp, do they need to sign up? Do they need to do a permission slip? What do they need to know? They do need to sign up because that helps Lynn and I know how much food to prepare for our lunches and uh, as well as drivers to take the children to uh, the activities that we have planned. And um, they can either call the office, but they d we do need to have a permission slip to transport the children and have any medical information about the children. Um, and so they so get <coughs> how do they get the permission slip? That can they get it that day or? Um, there are s there's sh there's one on the website. Okay. And um, 
I know that we had some in the office. Okay. So otherwise, come to me. You know, I'll be here at coffee hour upstairs. I can help you out if you have children you want to get signed up. Great. Thank All right. you. Thank you. Are there other announcements? Yes, Iris. Wait a minute. Now you, I know you got a good voice. You've been a teacher. But we're going to use the mic for those who are hard of hearing. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, you might have noticed that the sign-up sheets for the pie and ice cream social oh. are, are in the narthex. Um, Strawberry Fest was a great success, and we're hoping that the pie and ice cream goes just as well, and we thank you for everything that you do. We need lots of pies. Thanks. Need lots of pies, and sign up for the help, right? Yes, yes. Any other announcements? Karen. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm going to come up front because I'm super excited. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you. Lots of precious cargo coming home today, so please prayers for safe travels for all our great Peace Kids. Um, I'm here to promote um, the latest installment of the Penguin Project, which is a organization that, that partners with local theater, so in this case, Central Wisconsin Children's Theater. And it's a program where um, special needs actors are paired up with mentors and um, perform a musical. So this year they're performing Singing in the Rain and two of our awesome Peace Kids, um, Carly Canole and Kyle Brzezinski, are mentors this year. And so they stick real close to their artists and the artists' special needs, uh, you know, they range from very high functioning to very low functioning, but they're awesome and they do all of the acting, the singing, the dancing, um, it's a really touching experience. I highly recommend. I know the Morrises were able to attend last year. Um, so anyway, I'll put a poster up out somewhere, but it's the <laughs> last weekend in July. There's four shows, and this year they are performing at the UWMC. So um, just a shout-out not only to support our kids, obviously, but just a really fantastic program that's just, it'll, it'll touch your heart, I promise. Thank you. It's a wonderful ministry our youth are doing. Anything else? Any other announcements? Let's be in worship.
Please join me in the call to worship. Come before God with thanksgiving. For God's love and mercy are beyond measure. Out of our broken and divided lives, God offers us healing and wholeness. God delivers us from aimlessness and sin and restores our soul. God is good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. Teach us your way, O God, that we may walk in your truth with an undivided heart. Okay, let's remain standing for our next hymn. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Please pray with me. God of love, teach us your way. Our ego desires, self-centeredness, and pride often cause us to go astray. Where our actions have caused division or rivalry, where we have sought our own pleasure at the expense of another, forgive us. Receive our grateful thanksgivings for your continual faithfulness, guidance, and steadfast love. May we not be so quick to assert our own self-focused will, but open our hearts to your direction and purpose for our lives. Help us live with humility, justice, and compassion toward all. In Christ's name we pray, amen. be seated. <clears throat> Our scripture today is from Genesis chapter 25 verses 19 to 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the uh, Aramean and uh, Padanaram, sister of Laban the Aramean, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. 
after his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. <clears throat> Once when Jacob was cooking a stool, Esau, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Thank you. I invite the children to come forward. Okay, I need some children at heart who like candy. Come on. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. So, I'm going to teach you what a birthright is, all right? Chris, you don't get any. You're a female. Mike, you get two. And you get two. That's up to him and how good of a husband he is. And you don't get any either. But you actually, well, we're going to make you the eldest. You get to be young. You get a whole four. Is that fair? Does that feel fair? No, uh-uh, it doesn't. So what the deal is, the way it worked way back when, and even in Islam for some families today, it is the eldest son who gets the birthright, okay? And he gets a double portion of what any other son gets, and the women don't get anything because their only purpose is to have sons, and to, they're kind of considered a possession of the family, okay? They have no importance in the Bible. So whenever you hear a woman's name in the Bible, pay attention. She's important, okay, to even get named. Um, so that's what happens. Of course, that makes you the boss. When your dad dies, you, you are in charge. But if they're married and he dies, you got to make sure you take care of Chris over here, okay? <laughs> so some of that money, that's part of the reason why that extra money, you get more as the boss because you have to take care of any women in your family that aren't married and have a man to take care of. So there is responsibility that goes along with that. But you get to boss all the other men in the family too if they hang around and are stay a part of the family. Okay, now does that feel a little fairer? Ah, you would, it's all about birth, isn't it? It's kind of like the monarchy and who gets to be the next <laughs> king, right? But we're going to make sure you all get enough and we'll take up, I'll let you all take it upstairs and we'll double portion you. Yeah, and then you can take the rest up and there's even a whole nother bag for all of you who weren't brave enough to come in. And you can take the bag and put it up at uh, coffee hour. How's that sound? Because Gloria does not need to eat all that candy. <laughs> Just clean up your wrappers. You're welcome to eat it during the message. <laughs> That's how the birthright works. You can imagine if we had even littler children how unfair that would feel to them, right? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> it just doesn't seem fair. So over the next three weeks, we are going to explore the story of Jacob. And it begins today with 
Jacob wrestling from right in the womb with his brother, twin brother Esau, to the last week when we are going to see Jacob wrestling with an angel. So it's kind of wrestling to wrestling. And it kind of sets up the tone that there's a lot of tension that is going on with all this trouble and wrestling. So it's a following of his whole spiritual journey over the next three weeks. So I want you to imagine that you are sitting by a campfire. You probably don't read. The story has not yet been written down anywhere. But it's the story that is shared of who our ancestors are and where we come from and what is our family background. And of course, since we are faith descendants of Jacob, we get Jacob's side of the story. But there's another campfire somewhere else with Esau and his clan getting a whole other side of the story, I'm sure. We tend to tell the stories based on our own personal perspectives. But the stories tell us who we are as a people. And I absolutely love the Hebrew scriptures because they don't hold anything back. They lay it right all out there and let you know who the people are and in truth, who we are as well. And somewhere in the middle of all of that, we find God. So the story of Jacob begins with him and Esau right in the womb. He hasn't even been born yet. He's in Rebekah's womb, and the two of them are wrestling and tossing so much that poor Rebekah, the mother, goes to God and says, I don't even know if I can get through this pregnancy. It is so bad. Why is it even worth living? And she gets a word from God that she actually has twins within her and that there is a prophecy that goes with this. Of course, it's a reading back, right? We're at the campfire. We already know the full story, but we hear back that the prophecy is that there, were, there are two nations within her womb and that they will be divided and that the eldest one will end up serving the younger one. Now, if I were Rebecca and heard that, I would know that I was in for a lot of trouble coming forward, right? <laughs> That's not the greatest of prophecy or news that I think I would want to hear. So then, even at their birth, you have Jacob grabbing hold of Esau's heel. That's a play on Jacob's name, which is a heel or to supplant, but you also get that image that he's holding on the heel so he can pull it back and propel himself forward trying to be the firstborn, right? There's that wonderful image of the tussling of the two of them of who's going to have the power and who's going to have the control and who's going to have all the rights of the family. It starts right at the very beginning for them. Now, Esau and Jacob are two entirely different people. They're fraternal twins for sure. They do not even look alike. That doesn't mean all identical twins are exactly alike either. You all know identical twins? Some are like peas in the pod and others can't even stand each other because they're so different. But these two are definitely fraternal twins. And Esau comes out red, and that's what Esau or Edom ends up meaning, is the word red. So there is a play on the word red in the story. And he's hairy. And Esau's one of these strong guys. He's a hunter, and he's wild, and he's impulsive. And some would call him a man's man, okay? And he is his father Isaac's favorite. And then you have Jacob. Jacob is the quiet, pensive one 
who is much more of a thinker. And he likes to be around the tents, which means he hangs around at home. So some might call him a mama's boy in our day and age. And he is obviously Rebecca, the mother's favorite. So you can imagine the tension of these two growing up, okay? They, personality-wise, are worlds apart. They don't even see the world in the same way. And then you've got the parents playing favorites, and you know that if Esau goes to Jacob or goes to Isaac complaining about Jacob, Isaac's going to take Esau's side, right? Or vice versa with Rebecca. Rebecca would end up taking Jacob's side. Lots of family turmoil and dysfunction going on in this story. Can you feel it? It's set up right from the beginning, not just because of who Esau and Jacob are, but the parenting as well and the taking of the sides. So the story then jumps. And it jumps to when they're about teenagers, although there's no such thing as a teenager in those days and age. Did you know it's not really until World War II that there was such a thing as a teenager? Yeah. You were lucky if you finished high school. Most got through eighth grade. Then you went out. You worked on the farm. You got a job or you apprenticed somewhere. Teenagers really kind of a new thing. So. They are, at this point, have of that age, but they are out there having to support this family. And Esau has gone out hunting for some wild game because his father, Isaac, loves wild game. And Jacob is at home, and he is stirring a pot of stew. Can you picture that? He's cooking. Jacob likes to cook. And Esau comes back famished. He didn't catch anything, and he's hungry. He's tried as hard as he can, but now he's really, really famished. And you can tell now that Jacob has been stewing about more than this pot of stew. He has been stewing over much more, because when Esau asks for some of that stew, he says, I'll give you stew if you sell me your birthright. In other words, I get to be the boss, right? I get the double portion in exchange for this bowl of stew. Now, what does that tell you about them? Esau obviously seeks his immediate gain, his immediate gratification, because he says, I'm hungry. What's worth my birthright if I don't eat? Okay? He's not that starving. He could have come home any time. He's just hungry. But Jacob, Jacob uses this moment to extort the birthright from Esau. He has no care for his brother at all. He dehumanizes him as a person. The basic need of food for his brother, he uses for his own personal gain. We don't know anyone like that today, do we? We don't know people who don't care less about what somebody else's needs might be, and yeah, greed and personal gain and stepping on other people today is still a problem, isn't it? So I think of Martin Buber. Martin Buber was a Jewish philosopher that probably everyone who ever goes to seminary reads, okay? He had this wonderful theology of I thou. Anyone heard of I thou theology? Is this new to you all? He um, escaped Germany right during Adolf Hitler, so that gives you a time frame of where he's speaking. 
And his contrast is between I, thou, and I, it. And I, it is how so many of us live most of the time. We get in our busy lives. We have a need. We know somebody who can fit our need, and we just go and ask them to fit our need, and we don't even think about that person and who they are and what their needs are, right? Or what our asking of that request might mean to them. We tend to live very much in an I-it kind of a world. And what Martin Buber is saying is that we need more to live in an I-thou. And I think of my Quaker background where they would call one another thou. And I thought, well, maybe that's why all the time. It wasn't just using archaic language. But the thou, the I-thou, is to recognize the presence of God in that other person and to see them in their whole humanity and to recognize relationship between the two. Now, that doesn't mean that you still don't, if you have a need that you know somebody has a gift that they can fill, you don't still go and ask, but you ask with respect. You ask with an understanding that their life might be different and they may have issues. And they, a no is not an offense to you. It's an honoring that their life is where it is. And I, thou, is a relationship of respect and upholding the dignity of one another. And what Martin Buber says is this is the way God relates with us in I, thou relationships. Upholding our dignity, our humanity in love. I, thou something we could use a little bit more of, including myself, to focus on that. Well, Jacob's story doesn't quite end there. It did in our reading today, but where that story goes on before we're going to pick up next week is that with Rebecca's help and a lot of trickery, he manages not only to steal the birthright before, but he steals the blessing from his father on his father's deathbed. Now, blessings and curses were believed to have great power in that day. I wish we still felt blessings as being that powerful now. I like blessings. So, essentially, the blessing that his father gives him names him thinking it's Esau, names him as the one who will be the boss of the family and will have the great nation. Well, when Esau comes back, he is absolutely furious, and when his father realizes what happens, he's in a rage, even on his deathbed. And the story is very vibrant. Go to Genesis 27 if you want to read it for yourself, of how much this just really broke this family because Esau then starts plotting to kill his brother Jacob and Jacob has to run to his uncle his mother's brother for safety we'll pick up the story then later next week that division that occurs in a family you know, all the dysfunction that I hear in families' lives, why are we so surprised? Why do we look at them with some kind of a judgment? Because, you know, if you had an Ozzy and Harriet upbringing, consider yourself really blessed. Because I can tell you as a pastor, I hear so many stories, and you already know mine, with my mother having paranoid schizophrenia. It was no picnic at home, okay? But even in the midst of all that turmoil, we ask ourselves, where is God? And where was God in the story? We heard God in the prophecy with Rebecca and her pregnancy, but God is totally silent at this point in the story. But again, we're sitting at the campfire, remember? 
And as one who sits at that campfire hearing the story of our ancestors, what we know is that Jacob will later be named Israel. And Israel is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. So we already know, even in this horrible beginning, that somewhere God is at work. And that's the part of the story. How did we get from Jacob treating Esau so poorly and Esau wanting to absolutely kill him and the divisions of the parents? How did we get from there to being the 12 tribes of Israel? It's a spiritual journey that we hear in the book of Genesis. And this is where I find the amazing grace. Because even in the midst of all this dysfunction, God is at work. And if God can be at work in Jacob's life in the midst of all that turmoil and upheaval, then I know God is at work in my life and your life too. That our beginnings don't have to define who we are that we can have fresh new starts with God. You know, growing up, we have to develop a sense of self, separation from our mothers, and an identity of who we are, some ego strength, and a means and a way just to survive in this world. The issue, though, is when the power and the control and the self-promotion of ourselves and our desire for success over and above another person's well-being becomes our driving force, then what happens is we lose the sense of humanity that God has in mind for us. And it is actually through our troubles and our trials our frailties and our failings, our sorrows and our pain, that becomes the avenue by which God can move and grab a hold of us, right in the midst of our vulnerabilities. Because you know it's okay to say, I have failed, I messed up. It is okay to say, I was wrong because that gives room for grace then. And it lets us be more human. There are two women that I was thinking of. The first one I've mentioned, but I think I've probably mentioned both of them before, but Nadia Balls Weber, she was that woman I had a picture if you were here that Sunday, who's the Episcopal minister with tattoos all over her body, okay? And Nadia, um, is the pastor for all saints and sinners, recognizing that we're a both and. It's not an either or, but we're both saints and sinners. And she's the one who had to overcome a very troubled past and alcohol and drug addiction. And she puts it this way, God simply keeps reaching down into the dirt of humanity and resurrecting us from the graves we dig for ourselves through our violence, our lies, our selfishness, our arrogance, and our addictions. And God keeps loving us back to life over and over again. And Anne Lamont, who is a well-loved author and speaker, she's a Presbyterian, and she shares her faith story. She, too, overcame a very difficult path and addictions. She says, God loves you just the way you are, but loves you too much to let you stay like this. And then she says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. These two women freely share their stories. They're not pretty stories, and they both do it with some spicy language. But these two women are also drawing in a lot of people 
who otherwise had turned their back on the church. Because there's a real spiritual hunger this, these days in our nation for some real honest faith where we can freely share our painful, troubled stories, but also where God's grace moved in amongst one another. So I am hoping that we will treat each other as I thou's and that we will lift up our own stories with each other without fear of any judgment or condemnation, but just that we've had lives. And they tend to be pretty messy lives for the most part. But when we share them with one another, and don't feel like we as Christians are supposed to be perfect or never make a mistake or always be right or have these perfect families, but get real and honest about our continual need for grace. Well, that, when we share it with one another, is how God's grace flows right here amongst us. So this is my prayer that we will be real with one another, that you will share your story with me, that you will share it with one another, and help each other find where God has been moving in each other's lives. Because this is how we know that God is alive and still in control in spite of us all. Amen. You may be seated. Are there prayers of concern or thanksgiving that anyone would like to have outwardly prayed today? Karen? Yeah, try it. <laughs> Good morning. Sorry, me again. Um, absolutely prayers for a very dear friend of mine uh, from high school. Um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, very aggressive form. Um, so she's the first of our group of friends to get cancer, to be threatened in this way. So it's, it's new for all of us, and we're kind of reeling from it. She's a beautiful person. So prayers for her and her family. And um, her name is? Her name is Anne. Anne. Yeah. Um, Sweet Anne. Anyway, um, and some joys. Um, 
I, you know, there's lots of new faces in here. And just a reminder that we do have coffee hour upstairs after service. Attendance is a little lower in the summertime, so that means there's extra food. Um, <laughs> and you promise people won't bug you too much. Um, we'll even ignore you if that's what you prefer. But so you get to check out us and all our great exactly. weaknesses. Exactly. So, so <laughs> join us food. upstairs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Others? Okay, let us be in prayer. God of grace, help us receive the good news that you do love us just as we are. And that grace is at work within our lives, in our struggles, and our own wrestling spirits. Help us let go of the need for perfection, for power and control, and success as defined by this world. For there are only vain attempts to prove ourselves worthy of your love. Remind us again that there is nothing that can separate us from your love, not even our wandering, erring ways or divisive breaches in our relationships with others. Where we can be repairers of the breaches in our lives and reach out in reconciliation, grant us humility and loving hearts to do so. When we look at all the conflict and tension and fighting within our nation and between countries, and in our own personal lives. Remind us that human divisions within this world are nothing new to you. Help us remember you are divinely in charge and working out your goals for all humanity, both in the times of our trouble and in the times of joy. So help us to let go and to let you take control of our lives. Increase our trust in you. We bring to you this day our joyful thanksgiving and celebrating the birth of El Nathan to Eunice and Chris. May his life be full and blessed. And we rejoice with Phyllis on her 90th birthday and fill her days with good health and happiness. Here are our prayers for Michael Loomis and Bruce Wasleski in this time of sorrow in their lives and in their families. Comfort them with your peace and fill the hole in their hearts with your immense love. We ask your guidance in keeping our mission team safe on their return trip home. And for all of our folks and others who are traveling this time of year on vacation. As we look forward to Peace Camp, we ask for your presence to be with us so that all who attend may know your love and sense of belonging here in this place. Give the leaders a spirit of patient joy and fill them with your love as they seek to share it with the children and the youth. We pray for Karen's friend, Anne, who's come down with that diagnosis of breast cancer that can be so scary. We ask that you surround her in your love, but also that you guide the friend group to know how best to help Anne and to be your presence, your love for her. And we thank you for our guests in the summer of traveling and visitation and trying out new things. It is a joy to share some time with them. We lift to you now the silent prayers that are upon our hearts.
God, we give you thanksgiving for the joy of the sound of children, for it brings joy to our hearts. In all of this, God, we place our concerns and our thanksgivings into your hands as together we pray as Jesus taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not in temptation, but of us. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The mission and the ministry of this local church happens through our gifts and our financial support in God's grace alone. If you are not aware, we have no hierarchy, no other place to turn to for funds. It is our home, our responsibility to take care of this church. So I invite you to give generously in thanksgiving for all the generosity that God gives to us. Let the ushers come forward. This next song is written by a dude named Brian Sergio, who will be here uh, for Pastor Gloria's installation. He wrote the song, and from what I've read, he is one cool cat. <laughs>
reaching for the stars, but I won't forget the scars of Christ who died to show that the dreams for all. Everybody here we go. Dream God's dream. Holy Spirit, help us dream of a world where there is justice and where everyone is free. Please join me in the offertory prayer. Receive these gifts, O God, as a portion of our gratitude for the love and mercy you have given to us. May we offer this same loving kindness to others too. Bless our offerings and our hearts in your love. Amen. Friends, let us see the thou in one another to recognize the divine face of God within each one of us. Let us seek to share our stories so that we all know we're not alone, that we all are in this mess together. But in the middle of that share, where you found God's grace in your story to give each other hope. And now may the hope, the peace, the love, and the joy of Christ be with you all. Amen. <laughs>